Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the RIP webinar series. My name is Anne Kreitz, I'm the host for today's talk. If you are participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time or ask a voice question by raising your hand once the presentation is complete. Today's speaker is Lizzie Poole. Lizzie is a linguist working with SIO International Intensive in Mbukwe and Rangi languages. She works primarily on the documentation and description of these languages, especially to support orthography development. Her MA was on Bukwati with a particular focus on consonant clusters and vowel hiatus pollution. Please join me in welcoming Lizzie as she gives her talk on a closer look at the op optional prefix in Bukwe. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, I would like to talk a bit about what has been called an optional E prefix in Mbukwe. Um, and first, a little bit of background on the language, though it's probably familiar to most people. Um, oh, there we go. Um, so Mbugwe is a Bantu language classified as F34. Um, its closest linguistic neighbour is Rangi, as F33, but they're not geographical neighbours. Um, and in fact, both Rangi and Mbugwe are surrounded by non-Bantu languages. So here on the map, Mbugwe is the green area number 43 at the top and centre, and Rangi is the green area 38 in the middle. Um, so why do I want to talk about this? Um, my interest was piqued um, by this statement in Martin Mouse's grammar sketch, that there are also a number of routes um, that have an optional E prefix in class five. And I started to wonder whether this optional E prefix could occur on some, um, was only on some, or whether it could, be, could occur on all class five nouns. Um, if only some, which ones and why? And also what does optional mean? Is it true, truly free variation or is there a pattern in its distribution? So we'll look at both of these questions, um, but start um, by looking at some previous analyses of class five nouns in Mbukwe. So firstly, we have um, from Dempwolf about a century ago, he gave um, the class five prefix as Li, but all of the examples in his paper start either with an I or with a Y, um, except for one which starts with Tia, and I think that's probably just a typo and it should have been in class seven. Um, and then more recently, um, both uh, Maus and Wilhelmsen um, have described um, the regular pattern of the class five prefix as a zero prefix. Um, and then re as an option before certain lexically marked vowel root, uh, vowel initial roots that Wilhelmsen then um, described more specifically as those that started with G in Proto-Bantu. Um, and then each talk about an optional E prefix, um, but Wilhelmsen saying this is only optional on consonant initial roots and surfaces always as a glide on vowel initial roots. So let's see some examples of those. Um, so this is from Mouse, and the first three roots we can see are vowel initial, and we can see the re um, there in fireplace name and I. And then we have 12 consonant initial roots, all of which are attested with an initial E. Um, and then six of which are also test attested without it. Um, Wilhelmsen's examples, she attests to 10 consonant initial nouns with an optional E, but um, she didn't provide those examples. And then she also mentions some nouns starting with a Y. Um, but she analyzes as having an, un, an, initial, an initial E in the underlying form. So the examples she gives for that are yonder, analyzes E, onda, meaning field, with plural monda, and yao, as E, ao, tooth, um, and plural mao. Um, then in terms of the augment, the only mention of the augment in relation to Mbugwe is that there isn't one. Um, so as Wilhelmsen stated, some Bantu languages also have what is called a pre-prefix or augment, which is not found in Mbugwe. Um, and we will come back to this a bit later. So 
as I started to pay a bit more attention to these nouns to try and work out what was going on, um, I made some of the following observations. So firstly, that class five nouns were almost always written with an initial E in translated text, um, but that this E was not audible in my wordless recordings. Um, and that during the process of translation, most of the time translators insisted on writing an initial E and very occasionally didn't want to. Um, I'd like to make a brief excursion to describe what I mean by translated text in the context in which I work with SIL. Um, so it's usually Bible text that's translated um, from a variety of Swahili and English versions into Mbugwe. Um, well, in this case, into Mbugwe. And this is, um, for Mbugwe, this is done by writing. And our most basic writing principle is to write it as it sounds. Um, once the text is translated or drafted, the Mbugwe is translated back into Swahili fairly literally in order for a translation consultant to check the meaning. It's then read out loud to a group of Mbugwe representatives, um, usually about 30 people, men and women, different ages from different villages. Um, and they comment on, um, on the meaning, on the naturalness, on any tricky vocabulary um, and any changes that they um, talk about are, are made and implemented into the text. Then it's read out loud with a linguist um, and the translators. Um, essentially proofreading to check for spelling and other linguistic issues. Um, and when that's complete, the written text is approved for publication. Um, and then the final step is that um, the text will be read aloud as they produce an audio version of the text. So while the content of this translated text might not be what we would get from spontaneous speech or traditional storytelling, um, we're pretty confident that this translated text is natural and probably more so than, for example, a set of sentences elicited out of context from one or two informants. So all translated text examples that I use in this presentation will have been through this entire process, um, except for a couple at the end where the final audio recording hasn't been made. Um, so back to um, what I was, um, what I've been observing about the class five nouns. Um, during the checking process, um, all um, so the, there were a few words that translators said could never be pronounced with an initial E and a few that they weren't sure about. And it turned out that apart from loan words, every class five noun in my database could start both with or without an E. Um, and the nouns that we originally thought were class five that couldn't start with E, except um, again, except for a few loan words, they turned out to actually be class nine, six, not five, six, when I, um, when I listed them with a demonstrative. So having observed this, I decided to essentially start from scratch in looking at the morphology of class five nouns. So here are some consonant initial class five, six noun pairs um, from my wordless recordings. And um, so we've got bava, ma bava, fatero, ma fatero, kufa, ma kufa, um, et cetera. And it's fairly clear here that um, we have a pattern of a zero prefix in class five and ma in class six. Um, vowel initial roots um, display a slightly different pattern. Um, so firstly, just to say the different pronunciations in the plurals in D, E and F um, are probably, there's probably some sociolinguistic difference, whether that's related to age or geography or another reason hasn't yet been investigated. So I've included the three possibilities, but I'll probably pronounce them with the, the middle pronunciation as that's, that's the one that we're following for our spelling rules at the moment. Um, so on these, we can see a different pattern of prefixes. Um, we have in A, B, and C, we have an E in the singular, and again, ma for class six in the plural. Um, but then D, E, and F, we have re in the singular class five, um, and again, ma in the plural. Um, so notice that D, E, and F are all E initial roots, 
whereas A, B and C start with other vowels. Um, I only have class five nouns attested with E, A and O initial roots, so I can't give examples um, of roots beginning with other vowel phonemes um, at this stage. But with this, I have analysed the class five noun prefixes um, in the following way. So the zero prefix on consonant initial roots, re on e initial roots, and e on other vowel initial roots. So let's see how this compares with the previous analyses that I've mentioned. And I've got rid of Dempwolf's column here um, to, include, to include my analysis. Um, so we've got zero prefix um, described as the regular pattern, or as I've described it on consonant initial roots. And since the vast majority of nouns are consonant initial, um, I don't think there's any discrepancy here. Um, and also in the, the re form, um, again, I don't think there's a, a much of a difference here. So Wilhelmsen was able to describe a little bit more of the pattern that she saw. Um, but I think she's describing historically, and I'm just describing synchronically, because if we look at my E initial roots, they're actually all starting with G in Proto-Bantu. Um, so this Proto-Bantu data is from the Bantu, lex Bantu Lexical Reconstructions 3. Um, the number there is the ID number in the database, and the web address will come up in my references at the end. Um, so we've got a little bit of a semantic jump in C from grass to bundle of firewood, but I think that's probably close enough to be fairly sure that that's the correct um, pair. Um, and these are all of the I initial noun, class five nouns that I have. So there's not very many, only four, um, but as we can see, all of them start with G or have been reconstructed beginning with G in Proto-Bantu. And I also checked the other way around. I searched for all class five G initial Proto-Bantu roots. Um, and there were only 11 of those anyway. Um, and the other cognates I have are in different classes in Mbukwe. So for example, there's a Proto-Bantu reconstruction, Jigwa, um, meaning thorn, reconstructed as either class five or class three. And in Mbukwe, it's definitely in class three. Um, so I've checked both ways around and it seems that um, nouns reconstructed with initial G in Proto-Bantu and E initial roots now um, are just the same thing. Um, so that leaves us with the last line of the table. What we've seen so far is fairly straightforward. Um, and Martin Mouse, who first mentioned the optional prefix, by his own admission in the introduction to his grammar sketch, says that his study is based on a very short period of fieldwork with limited data and is by no means a full analysis. So it's not surprising that further data and time will pick up more details of the patterns that he began to describe. Um, and Will Wilhelmsen too was primarily focused on the tone system and verbal morphology of Mbugwe. So with this presentation and research, I'm hoping to fill in a bit of a gap building on these previous works. Um, so let's return to those initial observations. And I'd like to add one more. Um, that as I looked more and more at translated text and asked more questions during the checking process, I began to notice a tendency that the times when the translators didn't want to write the initial E, the noun was sentence initial. And so I decided to compare class five nouns in different environments. Um, the analysis we've seen so far is based only on nouns as they were, record were recorded as part of a word list. So I decided to listen to them as they occurred within sentences using longer texts. And um, these are some examples in the different contexts. So on the left, the first column, we have the pronunciation as was recorded as part of the word list. Um, and in the middle column, we have the pronunciation that occurred in the longer stretch of text. Um, and I restricted myself here to recorded stories and sentences rather than translated text. Um, in order that the speaker wasn't influenced by the spelling decision. Um, so we've already mentioned that there's no E in the word list um, pronunciations, but each time it was audible um, when the word appeared um, as part of a longer text. So let's listen to some of those so that you don't need to just take my word for it. 
Um, so here's the word rina, uh, meaning name. And so um, as part of a word list, it sounds like this. Mia tatu amsina tisa. Rina. 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 And then we'll listen to it as part of this sentence. So I've highlighted the word in red to help you um, catch it as it comes. Here it is. Oh my Rina. Let me play that one again for you. Oh my Rina. So I hope um, you agree with me that in the word list, there's no, there's just two syllables, just Rina. But in the text version, in the sentence there, you can, you can hear an E um, at the beginning of the word. Um, and this was true of all of the words um, in this in this table. Um, and the ones that interested me in particular were ones like the very last example, yonder, yonder, because we've seen this word farm before. We've seen it um, that the root starts with O, and we've got the the E prefix. Um, surfacing as a glide on the vowel initial root, just as Wilhelmsen um, described. But then when it appears in a stretch of longer text, it sounds like there's another E before the glide. Um, so let's listen to that one. Here's the word list version. Yonda. And Yonda. in the text, again, I've highlighted it in red so you can um, hopefully anticipate it. And so again, I can't hear any E at the beginning of the wordless um, pronunciation, but I can when it's part of a longer stretch of speech. So it looks to me like we've got two E prefixes. Um, and one of the important things to note here is that the initial E in the word list example is obligatory. So pronunciation without this E, um, something like onda, is ungrammatical. So this E, which I've highlighted in red, um, is not an optional prefix. That has to be there. And looking at all of the vowel initial stems, we get this same pattern. Um, we have the normal class five prefix as um, as I've shown in the previous analysis in each of the word list examples. But when the word, when the class five noun appears in a longer stretch of text, there is another E um, added on to the beginning of the word. Um, this pattern also works for the consonant initial roots, but since the prefix for these roots is analyzed as the zero prefix, it's not quite so visible. Um, so I've described so far the different environments as in the word list and in the text, but it would be um, good to be a little bit more precise. Um, so word list essentially means in isolation. Um, so as we consider a few more environments, let's start with um, an example where the noun is spoken in a sentence, but is utterance initial. So here, um, this is an elicited sentence when I was getting different verbal extensions. Um, and it's so, yeah, farm is the first word of the sentence here. Let me play that again. So again, I only hear two syllables here, so no initial E. Um, and then the next environment I'd like to look at is, again, sentence initial, but this time not utterance initial. So um, part of a longer stretch, um, but again, the beginning of a sentence. Um, this one's a bit longer, so again, hopefully the red highlighting will help you catch it as it comes. Let me play that one again. So again, I can't hear any initial E on the word Rina, um, meaning name, in this example. Um, and we've already seen some sentence medial examples. Those are effectively the text examples from before. So I won't replay those, but here they are um, as a reminder. We had the word name um, in the middle of a, of a sentence and farm 
in the middle of the sentence. And very occasionally I have found sentence medial examples without this initial E, but in each case, the noun appears at the beginning of a phonological phrase. Um, so note that when I say phrase for the rest of this presentation, I'll be referring to the phonological phrase, not, for example, the noun phrase, um, unless I specifically state otherwise. And these phrase initial but sentence medial examples are quite rare. So the examples that I have um, don't have the audio version. They've been through the checking process that I, I ran through earlier, but um, the final audio version hasn't yet been recorded. Um, but I can show you how the text changed during the checking process. So this screenshot shows you the current version of the text on the left and an old version on the right. And the highlighting shows the change that was made as the translators and I read through the text together. So you can see that on the right highlighted in um, pink, we have the word Irina um, written with the initial E, but then over on the left in green, this E was removed during the check um, to give just Rina. And the key thing to mention here is that the spelling was corrected according to pronunciation. If you recall, I said our basic rule is to write it as you say it. Um, so the, the meaning of this, this verse is, um, because the mighty God has done great things for me, his name is holy. So um, since the possessive follows the noun in Mbugwe, um, name occurs at the beginning of a phonological phrase here. Um, and um, a second example, so it's not just, not just a one-off. Um, now we've got the word famine or um, perhaps more literally disaster of hunger. Um, and we have irango on the right-hand side in pink um, and changed to just rango um, in green on the left-hand side as we um, read the text together. So again, um, this one would be um, translated when he had finished destroying all the possessions he had in this way, a famine then entered that country. So the word famine um, occurring at the beginning of a new phonological phrase here. So I um, have found, I think, a pattern in the distribution of this initial E. Um, it's in complementary distribution that it's present phrase medially, um, phonological phrase medially, but absent elsewhere. Um, so before um, moving on to what this initial E is, I'd just like to um, summarize briefly. I mentioned two questions at the beginning of this presentation, and these have both now been answered. So the optional E can and does occur on all class five nouns, um, aside from a few loan words. Um, and there is a pattern to its distribution. Um, and so the key remaining question is, what is this prefix? Um, so if we have a look at um, these examples we've seen before, but um, I've got consonant and vowel initial roots here, so you can see all of the different um, types of example in, in one place. And it looks as though we've got two different structures for class five nouns. We have E, noun prefix root, when the noun occurs phrase medially, and we have just noun prefix root elsewhere. And this looks very much like the structures that we see in languages with augments. So I'd like to propose that this optional E prefix is the augment in Mbugwe. Um, and I haven't done a lot of reading about the augment since I've only recently come to the conclusion that Mbugwe actually has an augment. Um, but I think there is evidence to support this analysis. So firstly, the vowel noun prefix root structure that we've seen is very reminiscent of um, the, the structure of um, nouns in languages with augments. Um, it's already very well attested that nouns can appear with or without their augment. So the idea that this E is optional um, is not particularly surprising if we consider it to be an augment. Um, and van der Velde um, also um, explained that the augmented form is default. And that's, that's the way around we see it in Mbugwe as well. It's present everywhere except for the beginning of a phonological phrase. Um, and perhaps some negative evidence, which is maybe not quite as strong, 
but if it's not the augment, then then there are some problems that we still um, need to think about. Um, firstly, we'd need to propose alternating prefixes iri ri and e or e on vowel initial roots. Um, and VCV and VC, the first of each of those two pairs, are not typical Bantu noun class prefix shapes. Um, and even if we said, okay, that's fine, they're just a bit odd, we'd still need to explain the alternation in form. Um, it doesn't help us explain, just saying um, that we've got two different prefixes doesn't help us explain why those might be different. And in a sense, the augment analysis is just there waiting for us ready to use um, and slot and bugway into that pattern. Um, I think this is not without some challenges. Um, so firstly, the conditions for the absence or presence of the augment tend to be discourse or syntax related. So to do with referentiality, definiteness, specificity, um, a focus constituent, negative clause, um, nouns in negative clauses with pre-nominal modifiers. Um, Van der Velde also reports um, style, register, or sociolinguistic reasons, such as kind of distinguishing between two groups that have otherwise similar dialects. One would use the augment in order to um, say we're different from that group who don't use the augment. Um, and the only reference I've seen to phonological conditioning is related to um, the prosodic well-formedness of words. Um, saying that the augment is present to satisfy a minimality constraint on monosyllabic or vowel initial roots. Um, and that's not the phonological pattern we've seen in Mbugwe. Um, but perhaps since the behaviour of the augment is so already attested to be so widely varying across languages, it may not be quite too far-fetched to add another condition to the list of possibilities. And um, there's certainly no general agreement about what the augment, about the function of the augment across Bantu in general. Um, on the other hand, a suggestion from a colleague that I haven't had a, had a chance to look into yet is that the presence or absence could be determined by a discourse or syntactic condition that simply correlates with the appearance of the noun at the beginning of a phonological phrase. For example, if the noun is the subject of the clause, there would be a tendency for it to occur at the beginning of the clause. And that's also likely to be the beginning of the phonological phrase. And if that is the case, um, and I'd like to look into that, then this challenge would actually turn into more of an argument to support the augment analysis. Um, so it's definitely something I would like to explore a little bit further. Um, and before uh, I ask for some feedback and, and we look at some questions, um, I'd like to um, take a brief look at how Rangi compares um, with its structure of class five nouns. So um, essentially it works differently to Mbugwe. Class five nouns in Rangi almost always have a prefix E and there's no indication that this E is optional. Um, so here we have four Rangi five, um, class five and six noun pairs. So we have Ibote, Mabote, Ikufa, Makufa, etc. cetera. Um, and there's no indication ever that this initial E in the first, um, first column of each of the examples um, can never be dropped. Um, there are some slightly different structures you can see in Rangi class five nouns. Um, so here in red are pieces, let's say, which look analogous to something in Mbugwe. So in the first column, um, we've seen these words in Mbugwe. Um, and it looks like what I've analyzed as a class prefix in Mbugwe is part of the stem in Rangi. Um, so the plural of name um, in Mbugwe we saw as maina, um, whereas here in Rangi we have marina. Um, and similarly for um, in Mbugwe hands, we had manja, whereas Rangi we have mayanja. Uh, so it looks like this initial, the re and the e that we saw as prefixes in Mbugwe have been reanalyzed as part of the stem in Rangi in these cases. Um, in D and E, we have an alternative form of the prefix, again, re, 
for class five. Um, and so example D is a monosyllabic stem. Example E is a vowel initial, um, E initial um, root, sorry. Um, I don't have as much Rangi data as I do in Bugwe data with audio. So um, I, I'd need to look at some more examples to see if that, that pattern of vowel initial roots or monosyllabic roots um, extends further. Um, and then F is a slightly strange one. Um, again, it looks like the re that we saw as a prefix in Mbugwe for class five is part of the stem, uh, as part of the roots in Rangi. But in this case, it doesn't follow the pattern that we see in A, B and C, um, where the class five then has an E. Um, in this case, we just have a zero prefix um, on the class five noun. So we have Rico, Marico. Um, there is actually one more Mbugwe example that's interesting in terms of this idea of reanalysis of the class prefix. So the word for voice um, or sound in Mbugwe um, phrase medially, we have irio and elsewhere we have rio. So if we look at the Proto Bantu reconstruction for this, not quite sure which one to use, but probably the first one um, in this case, um, it's, it would be a monosyllabic. Uh, root now in Mbugwe. And so it looks like possibly because it was a monosyllabic root, um, the re class prefix has now been reanalyzed as part of the um, stem. And it now behaves um, just as any other consonant initial class five noun would behave in Mbugwe. Um, I previously had the plural form Mario in my database, but um, since then, other Mbugwe have said that there isn't any plural form for this word. To say voices, they would just say the voice of many people. Um, so unfortunately, I can't check the singular with the plural um, here, but I thought it was just interesting to compare with some of the Rangi examples to see that um, it does look like this pattern has happened a little bit in Mbugwe as well. Um, so, that's all I'd like to share with you today, but I do have some questions that I'd like your input on um, or feedback on. Um, and firstly, um, is the idea of having an augment in only one class reasonable? Um, I'm not sure I've come across that before. Um, so, yeah, um, I suppose if there was a class that was going to behave differently, <laughs> we'd probably expect it to be class five because um, it often does some slightly strange things. Um, but yeah, how, yeah, does anyone know of, of other languages where the augment is attested in only, in only one class? I think I've seen examples where it's attested in every class except one, but not in only one. Um, another question would be, is anyone aware of situations where the phonological environment other than minimality constraints governs the presence or absence of the augment. Um, and I do plan on looking into the syntax suggestion um, that I mentioned earlier, but it would still be interesting to know um, if anyone's aware of other phonological conditions um, governing the augment. Um, and then I guess my main question is what else needs to be considered in testing the hypothesis that the E prefix is the augment? What else would you want me to show you um, to be convinced as it were? Um, and then finally, in terms of the historical view of these languages, could or does the difference between Mbugwe and Rangi help inform our view of the historical picture of these two languages? Um, for example, does it suggest that Mbugwe is perhaps more conservative than Rangi, having retained a trace of the augment where Rangi has lost it? Um, so I will um, bring up my references here um, and then yeah, we can open for discussion. I'll go back to the question slide for that. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your presentation, Lizzie. Uh, so with that, we can start the question and answer section. So the question and answer section will be open to voice questions as well as written ones. If you would like to ask a question, just raise your hand uh, using the nonverbal controls, which are present underneath the participant panel. And I will send you a request to unmute. If you prefer to ask a written question, that's also still possible. You can do so using the Zoom chat module and as usual, I will read out the question. 
Please remember that the webinars are being recorded so that if you ask a question, this will be part of the recording and will be released on the YouTube channel. I see that Martin has already raised his hand, so I'll ask him to unmute. Okay, I, I unmuted myself. I am, do you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, Lizzie, what a wonderful talk. Thank you, thank you. I really enjoyed it thoroughly. And I have many questions. I won't throw them all at you because I'm sure other people have questions too. Um, but um, one is just for the data. In the beginning, you, um, you mentioned a few times that um, uh, to restrict yourself to native and bookwe words. So I wondered, is there anything to say about the behavior of, uh, of loans? So um, when I was checking whether this E could appear on um, on all class five nouns, it was loan words the informants particularly struggled with um, knowing whether it could be there or not. Um, so some people said yes, it could appear with or without, and other people have said no. Um, so. Um, yeah, I think those probably need checking a bit more carefully with a, a wider variety of people. Um, and those were Swahili loans? They're mostly Swahili, but some of them you could see, well, come through Swahili, yes, um, but okay. had clearly been Arabic or English or, oh, yeah, um, okay. yeah, originally. Um, mm. I don't recall that I have any from, for example, neighbouring um, Cushitic languages, for example, or for, yeah, or for Maasai. Yeah. 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 Um, if I can say a little bit my general idea about the augment, and I, I the other questions I leave for later, is that, um, um, yeah, how should I put this? The, to, to me, to to call it, uh, uh, to me, the main interesting part of your, your whole presentation is, is the synchronic analysis. And, um, and to, uh, to give it the label augment doesn't uh, bring that much in that respect because you don't know what it means in terms of a synchronic analysis. So it's just giving mm -hmm. it a name. If you give it that name, then it immediately has uh, the ring and you, you mean it that way uh, of a historical uh, claim that it comes from the historical Bantu augment. And for that, uh, you would want to see an historical analysis, actually. So mm -hmm. no, I have never seen a language where it is only in, in, in one uh, uh, noun class. Um, and so, um, but, but to, to me, that question is, is, is only interesting in a historical analysis of uh, the, the real the interesting thing is uh, what are the conditions uh, synchronically? And it seems yeah. to be then really just do that one class, which is, which is, uh, and all you say about the reanalysis, re I, I, I completely buy that, that you have a series of reanalyses. And uh, it could also be historically that in book we, uh, yeah, reintroduced uh, E for these class five. Uh, nouns uh, having forgotten all about uh, the, 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 the finities of, of the augment. For the yeah. augment, what I would want to see is what, what they do with names that are derived from class five nouns. Okay. Person, personal names. If you can yeah. see that they never have the E, uh, then, then I'm happy to see it as the historical Bantu uh, augment. Okay. Great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and definitely that syntactic and discourse um, side of things is something that I want to look in, look into more. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I'll add names to that list. Yeah. Yeah. Then I see that Ronan Kiesling has also raised his hand. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, brilliant. Yes. Um, 
it's a bit um, following up what Martin says and addressing the third question, uh, the third of your questions on the on this list. Um, of course, one would look for any traces of functions of the augment in terms of uh, semantics. And what I know about uh, this or other languages, but rather from the southern part of Tanzania, that you find an augment, um, well, uh, doing a job of marking something like specificity, uh, where the absence of the augment uh, signalizes non-specificity. And thus, I was wondering if you have checked uh, this maybe uh, in a non-specific uh, usage of nouns in, in uh, cases like I have no farm or I have no X, uh, whether there's some uh, whether you find the augment or not, or uh, from the way you presented it, it seemed as if it, uh, if there's no uh, semantic or syntactic condition that you could uh, fix, but rather a, a phonological one, or rather the um, the position of the of the um, of the noun with respect to a pause. That's my remark. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to look at things like specificity yet. Um, and so those kinds of examples, um, the, that suggestion was given a week ago. <laughs> um, so yeah, definitely want to carry on looking, looking at that. Um, so yeah, examples like that would be really helpful to, um, to use to, to figure out. I can't think off the top of my head. Um, examples like I have no farm. Um, how that would be, I'm not sure. I've seen them like that, at least not to pay attention to. Then um. I see that in the chat, there is a, a question slash comment from Andrew Harvey. He says, brilliant talk, Lizzie. It's great to see how your methodology can answer questions like these. Regarding, uh, regarding the last question you posed at the end of your talk, I'm wondering what the status of the augment is in the other Bantu languages of the area. For example, he knows that the augment is pretty robust in languages like Ihansu, uh, Nilamba, Nyatu, uh, but he doesn't know about Pare or the other Bantu languages which have been argued as members of a common predecessor. And he also adds that he doesn't expect you to personally know the answer to this at this point, but he wonders if anyone else in the group knows. Yeah, so I, I don't know, but if anyone does, it would be great to, to hear from them. Thanks. Um, Martin responds in the chat that, as far as he remembers, there is no augment in Pare. And he has raised his hands. There are so, so many things that I, I, I want to chat about. Uh, uh, just a tiny detail. Um, uh, very wise to say, OK, I, I'm now not going to use those texts that are read out. As a, as mm -hmm. a, but still, I'm I'm very curious. What do they do when they when they read out to those texts? When we when we check them as ling as the linguists and translators, you mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. Do they do they? Yeah. So there would be me as the linguist, and then two translators in the room, and but, one translator would read it, um, and the other one and I would listen for various things. Um, so I but can't what listen do they do for e? What do they do for this E? Well, essentially, as they just read a passage, the other, the other translator and I will listen to whether what is written matches what is said. Um, and then anytime it doesn't match, we'll ask about it. Um, and it was in it was in those cases where the noun appeared at the beginning of a of a phonological phrase where I didn't hear the person reading say it, and so we stopped and we discussed what's the most natural pronunciation in that context. And in each case, if it was written there, they took it out um, okay. and said, "Yeah, actually, no, we wouldn't say that." Um, 
I also find it interesting, yeah. just as an orthography rule. But anyway, uh, yeah, we're very much in the development stage of our of the orthography at the moment. So yeah, um, yeah. the um, the thing, the the rule. I mean, uh, yeah, Roland just formulated as as uh, just uh, after pause and. Um, because uh, you 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 say that um, what did you say there? It, it's a beginning of a, of an utterance or sentence, and then sometimes a beginning of a phonological phrase. The examples that you gave were actually beginning of clauses. Um, yes. So I I. I would be interested in teasing that one out. So all the all the all the cases where you uh, where you don't do the e, which which are not beginning of a clause, and that that would be of interest. Whether that's following a pause, as uh, as Roland suggests. Yeah, I definitely like to see whether those those two things correlate, and so whether the 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 reason might actually be the discourse or syntactic condition it just happens to also be that phonological um context um but yeah um that's for further and, research that i haven't had a chance to look at yet yeah and, and you have to uh, you have to write this up and publish it no? and, and don't don't worry about whether it's historically augment or not but uh, okay <laughs> I, I would, uh, definitely yeah this this needs to be published yeah at some point that's the plan. <laughs> we'll see. I see in the chat that there is a, a question from Michael Karani. He says, in connection to Roland's question on specificity, function of arguments in Bantu languages, he wonders if you ask native speakers about what is slash will be missing if one produces a class five noun in a sentence without the arguments. How does that become ungrammatical if it does? And this will help you to identify the functions of the e or ri. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think our discussions, they were mo mainly focused on what sounds right and what sounds wrong. We didn't go very much into why or um, I think I think we I think I have tried, but it was very difficult for people to um, or for these translators to explain what the difference was other than it doesn't sound right. Um, yeah, I guess it's quite a subtle thing, um, which I suppose is probably why I focused up until now on the phonological environment, because that's that's all that they were able to describe in a sense. So to say, well, if I if I pause, then I then I don't say it, it doesn't sound right. To, to say the e, but if it's in the middle of a sentence, then then I want to say it. Um, yeah. Marta, go ahead. Yes, I was wondering about uh, the the early uh, the early works, Temple, because you say that he uh, he, he has always e uh, if you look at his actual texts. Um, would you have any examples of the Demphorf text where the E should not be there in your analysis, but it's still there in his, like the beginning of a sentence? So I didn't see any texts from Demphorf. The only. Oh, the sentences um, just, yeah. Well, not even sentences. It was just a list of words that appeared in class five. So. Um, okay. Yeah. So nothing to be done there yeah yeah <laughs> thank you uh, i think those were all the questions and comments for today uh, i'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that recordings of all of the presentations in the rift valley webinar series can be found on the rift valley network youtube page and entries for each presentation are added to the rift valley bibliography looking ahead the next webinar will be on wednesday the 24th of march uh, presented by andrew harvey and richard griscom uh, with a retrospective of the Rift Valley Network webinar series year two. Uh, I would like to thank Lizzie again for her presentation and of course everyone else for participating today and I hope to see you again at our next webinar.